on today's show. It's all about the effects of urbanization on salmon. everyone at home and welcome to another great episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Katie. And I'm Drew. You know Katie, a very big problem in Alaska is urbanization. With so many streams, lakes, rivers and ponds in Alaska, roads oftentimes have to be built over the streams. You're right Drew, and unfortunately the health of the fish is oftentimes disregarded. Luckily though, there are efforts underway to help protect and conserve salmon and their habitat. In fact, we're going to get a chance to look at some of them today. Well, I think we should get started. All right. We're here at Cottonwood Creek in Wasilla, Alaska, and we're going to learn about the effects of urbanization on streams. You know, Drew, it's such a shame to see the effects of people's actions on our environment. It's really ruining the habitat for these salmon. Well, let's check in with Jeff and find out more about how the stream got this way. Let's go. All right, guys, here we are on Cottonwood Creek, right where the Seward Meridian Parkway crosses it. So we call this a road crossing of a stream. You look up this way, upstream, and it looks like a natural stream condition. But when you look downstream, you've got this culvert here and no plants around the culvert. Oh. To me, that means this is a degraded site because there's no fish habitat right along the shoreline here and the creek speeds up as it goes through that culvert. So there's a bunch of different things that can happen as a result. First of all, it's hard for a baby fish to get through that pipe. It's too, too fast of water. Secondly, there's nowhere to hide from predators all around this edge. Mm. There's no cover from the sun. Uh, basically, there's no habitat for the little juvenile salmon that live here year round. Do most degraded sites have a road crossing over top? Many. Um, unfortunately, road crossings are some of the most, uh, the greatest impact on streams. If they're not designed properly, if they're not built properly, they can cause all sorts of impacts on a stream. And does the whole stream look like this? Like this right here by the culvert? Right here. Well, the whole stream, generally it looks like this. The, this stream is in pretty good shape except right around the road crossings or areas that are heavily used by people. So this is how it's supposed to look like over here? Yes it is. Okay. And what are the benefits of that type of environment? Well this is a, a wetland type of stream. You can actually see fish jumping to get up at insects right in here. Um, it's slow water. There's lots of places to hide with all the plants that are still intact. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, this is a great rearing area for salmon. Rearing means a place where the salmon grow up to get large enough to swim out to the ocean and survive for a couple of years. So how do you fix a stream bank that looks like that? Well, this one would take a lot of work. Uh, we, what we would try to do is to get the vegetation reestablished all along this edge. So how long would it take for this site to be restored? I think this one would take probably two years. First of all, you'd have to design the solution. You'd have to figure out how to deal with all the traffic while you're replacing the culvert. Right dealing with blocking the vehicles off. This is a rel relatively complex project. So what kind of salmon are in this stream? Well, there's two species of salmon that run up this stream. There's about 20,000 sockeye salmon, also known as red salmon. So it's an abundant sockeye run for such a small stream. Wow. Then also there's coho salmon, known as silver salmon, and there's almost 2,000 of those that come up here every year, wow. adults returning from the sea. Neat. Uh, in addition, there's rainbow trout and dollyvard and char that live in the stream but don't migrate out to the ocean. So it was really unfortunate to see such a degraded culvert. I know, I couldn't believe that human actions were ruining fish habitat so immensely. Sometimes the baby fish would even die. At least there have been some efforts to restore the bank vegetation and fix the culvert. Hopefully their efforts will be successful in the near future. Don't go away, when Aqua Kids returns, we get to see how the restoration pays off. Aqua Kids presents another Aqua Kids pop quiz. 
Thousands of bald eagles make their homes along the waterways of Alaska. Approximately how many bald eagles keep a nest in Alaska? Is it A, 4 to 5,000, B, 10 to 15,000, or C, 30 to 35,000? Don't fly off. We'll be back with the answer after the break. The Pebble Partnership wants us to believe their plans for Pebble are unprecedented. But the Pebble process is the problem. You see, there are no standards in Alaska's mine permitting process. Nope, international mining companies could dig up 50 feet of salmon streams or 50 miles. That's wrong. It's time for an independent review of the Pebble permitting process. That's as clear as the waters of Bristol Bay. Well, did you land on the correct answer for our pop quiz? The answer is C, 30 to 35,000. I'm glad they're wild. I'd hate to have to change the paper in all those cages. Alaska, Alaska. We're headed back to Cottonwood Creek in Alaska, where we're going to take a look at a newly restored site. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's go see if their hard work paid off. Well, we've just left the degraded site and come further down Cottonwood Creek, where we're going to look at a recently restored site and talk to some of the people that made it happen. Let's go have a look. Hey guys, this looks really great. This looks like a lot of hard work. Yeah, it was. Thanks. How, how long did it take you to do this? Um, for like the whole crew, the whole work, it took about four days. Okay. Hey Amber. Hi. So this place does look great. How long ago was it restored? We did the actual on the ground work in May of 2011, so it's been a little over a year now. So when did the planning process start and what was involved in that? Uh, we started in March harvesting what we call dormant willow cuttings to use to revegetate the stream bank. So we go out, uh, we cut willow, we bundle them up and put them in the freezer and then store them until May when we actually did construction on the project. So what is the process for restoring the stream? Uh, the technique that we used here is called uh, brush layers and we, use, we start that with a coir log. It's kind of like a layer cake and so we're going to build up the stream bank with the, several layers. We start with a coir log, we entrench it into the stream bottom about six inches deep and stake it down and then the next layer above that we use those dormant willow cuttings that we harvested in March and we'll put them in the ground and they're still dormant but they'll start to uh, leaf out pretty quickly after we get finished the project. Jade and Zach were actually two students who worked on this project. What got you guys involved? Oh, my seventh grade science teacher, Misty Buchanan. And did you enjoy working on the project? It was a really rewarding experience. Uh, it gave us a great opportunity to connect with nature and uh, back to our uh, native habitat. And did you have an interest working with the environment, or did this maybe help spark an interest in that? Well, I think all the students that came out here had an inherent interest in the environment, um, even before they came out. Mm -hmm. But this really just helped put that interest into a formalized setting where a lot of learning could happen. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Buchanan. Hi. So we heard you're the one who organized this project. I was one of the teachers who organized it, yeah. How long have you been putting these projects together? We've been doing this for seven years. Wow. And we've had over 200 students every year, so that makes well over 1,000 students we've That's had. That's great. How do you choose which sites to restore? Well, our, our school partners with local agencies like the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, um, local soil and water districts, along with uh, private landowners even. Oh, so a lot of people come together to make this yeah, happen. Yeah, everybody wants salmon. <laughs> <laughs> what does this restoration do for the environment? How is it good for the stream? You know, Drew, our students learn uh, that salmon depend upon the forest around them, around the stream. All this we see right here actually has an um, important effect on the ability of salmon to survive in the stream. Um, and the trees actually depend upon the salmon to bring nutrients from the ocean back up stream to the inland environment. Hey, Catherine, how are you involved in this project? Well, at the time, I worked for the Wasilla Soil and Water Conservation District, and I worked really closely with the students and the teachers all year long doing education on the importance of salmon streams. A lot of people don't even realize that we have one of the most productive salmon streams and trout right here in the center of one of the busiest neighborhoods in downtown Wasilla. We're right next to the Parks Highway, a lot of businesses, busy neighborhood, and a lot of people enjoy coming down here but they don't really realize the damage that can be done when ATVs go through the streams. So I worked with the science teachers at Teelan Middle School in their River Rangers program. I also got some funding and advice from Fish and Wildlife Service and Fish and Game. And since then, my own company, Matsu Conservation Services, has been helping out with some of the maintenance and some of the outreach and education publicly. So you really helped to put all the pieces together in the project. Exactly. That, that's a lot of the role that I've worked in in the nonprofit world and the business world is in 
pulling all the strings together. I've worked a lot in the role of juggling all the different pieces, whether it's educational, funding, technical advice on how to do restoration, or the public education. Mm -hmm. What a fantastic and well-loved spot this is. But it's kind of a well-kept little secret. A lot of folks don't really know about the aquatic insects living down under the gravels or the importance to salmon fry of this little stretch of Cottonwood Creek. So people would really take more care of the environment if they learned how important the ecosystem and the animals are that live in it. I think you're absolutely right. It's not that people don't care, they just may not have the knowledge of what's living in the stream. From aquatic insects up to the salmon fry, to salmon and trout themselves, even the whole plant community along the banks in the riparian area are extremely important to the health of the waterway and the aquatic animals. Hey Jeff, what do we have here? Well, we've actually got a really good selection of the types of native trees and shrubs we'd like to see along a stream around here. Now this one's the Pacific Willow. It's got a really long and narrow leaf. Notice that one's green on the underside. Yeah. And we've got another willow here. It's called the felt leaf willow. It's, it provides fantastic habitat for moose and salmon. It's called felt leaf. It's got that whitish felt on the back side. And then up behind the willows, we've got a few other very uh, good native plants for this area. This is the alder, green alder. It actually fixes nitrogen and so makes the soil healthier for other plants. Uh, we've got some cottonwood right up here. It's got more of a smooth leaf instead of having the serrated edges. And that'll form a large tree and stabilize the stream banks. And then finally we've got uh, paper birch back here with the reddish bark. And that's pretty much the most common native uh, deciduous tree in this whole area. Wow. Well, it looks like you've got a wide variety of plant species here. I wouldn't have noticed that at first glance. Well, and it's exactly the sort of plants that we like to provide the healthy salmon habitat in the stream. It was awesome to see that other teens are taking a hands-on role in the environment by helping to restore the banks. It sure was. I'm glad that all their hard work, time, and effort really paid off for the fish and other animals living in the stream. That's right. Don't go too far because when we come back, the Aqua Kids visit a fish weir. Alaska, Alaska. Our Alaskan adventure continues here on the Funny River. The Funny River? Come on, Drew, stop making jokes. No, that's actually its name. We're going to be learning about all sorts of cool technology used to track fish migration upstream. Well, that sounds awesome. Let's go check in with Clark and Rachel, who are learning all about it right now. All right. So, Alyssa, we have a weir behind us. Can you tell me what that is? Well, the weir essentially will funnel fish up, that are migrating upstream into the trap and through the video component. And they're not allowed to go anywhere except into the chute that you can see here sticking out of the water. Right, just the middle part there? Just the middle part, yep. And the trap can be opened or closed to, move, to let fish move freely or closed so we can take samples. And then, like I said, the last component is the video box that is an underwater camera that turns on and off for motion. And cool. we record the fish moving around. And what are you recording exactly? Uh, how many fish are moving, when they're moving, the species and the sex of fish. Before the video, how are the fish monitored? Well, my job would be, would be very different. Instead <laughs> of sitting in a cozy office, watching the fish move through on a video, I would be sitting on this weir for hours at a time, hoping and waiting for fish to go through. What type of data are you collecting on the fish? Well, we do a hands-on data collection. That's when the trap is set. And we also do the video collection. Uh, they're a little bit different. The hands-on collection, we take scale samples to determine their age. We take two different uh, length measurements. We sex them and uh, identify their species. There are several species of salmon that do run up the river. And then the video is just counting how many are coming through and uh, the species and the sex as well. And we do merge that data to get a full count for the season eventually. Are you targeting certain species? Yes, we are watching for Chinook or King Salmon. They are a major species here. They're the big fish that people come here fishing for. Yeah. So uh, we have a couple today I think we can show you. So what's the data used for? Does it help with fish management at all? Yes, it helps give us a historical perspective of when the fish are moving, what fish are moving, and uh, help um, collaborate with other agencies to come up with uh, regulation that will help sustainable fishing. Cool. Does the fish weir constrict water flow or affect the habitat in any way? Well, this is not a natural structure, so there is probably some influence on the natural substrate of the, the stream bottom, the, the banks, but it's the most non-invasive means of collecting really important data and um, 
the biologists have been working for years on coming up with this method and it seems to be the best so far. So Alyssa, can we get a closer look at it? Absolutely, let's get in. Okay. We've come over to get a closer look at the weir and we're here standing at the trap where it was open overnight and it's been closed. We actually have a few fish trapped in here. Clark's getting a closer look with his video camera over there. Uh, can you tell us what fish are in here? Yep, there's a few Dolly Vardens, which are salmon, uh, one Chinook, and possibly a few other little ones that are not too exciting to look at. We like the big fish here. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, now we're going to get in the weir, get a closer look at the fish, and try some sampling. All right. This is a Chinook salmon. Whoa. Yep, and this is actually a female that is getting ready to spawn. We put them in the cradle so they're supported and we keep them in the water. Yeah. This is actually illegal to take a king salmon out of the water if you're doing catch and release. With so many fishermen here, it's really important to keep them healthy and in the water. Right. So we actually want to take measurements from the fish. We take two different measurements. And the first one is a total length from its snout to the fork and its tail. So on the side of the cradle, we have a measuring device and we do it in millimeters. So this one is at 640 millimeters, wow. the total length. And we take a mid eye length, which is an older form of measurement that was taken historically. And it's not always the most accurate measurement, but we take it anyway to help grandfather in that old data. Right. And will females be larger than the males? Not always. Some people think that uh, there is a term called sexual dimorphism, which is a difference in size or color between male and female. Mm -hmm. And that's not always true with salmon. Uh, the females need to be just as large as the males to help propel them upstream. They face all the same obstacles that the males do. Right. Um, so sometimes they can look very similar. Hey Ken, what you doing there? Hey Drew, just counting some fish moving through the video weir. What are you doing? I guess I'm watching you watch fish go through the video weir. <laughs> <laughs> so how does this video system work? Well, what we have is an underwater video camera located on the weir, which you guys just saw. And that video signal is an analog signal. Wow. It gets routed back to this uh, computer, which is called a DVR, digital video recorder. And the DVR converts that signal into a digital format instantaneously. So why are you doing this? What's the benefit? Well, the primary advantage to using the uh, underwater video compared to conventional methods is it reduces the amount of uh, time we spend on the weir counting fish. So as fish pass, uh, the DVR uh, removes any blank video footage and only records motion events of fish or twigs or river otters passing through. So you don't have to stand here for 24 hours watching? You don't have to stand here 24 hours. <laughs> what happens if the water's murkier, if there's something blocking the camera? Well, that's a nice uh, thing about underwater video is it really doesn't matter if the water is murky or not. Uh, what we have is these fish are funneled through a small opening, so it's six to eight inches uh, from the field of view of the camera. And because of that, the fish is typically four to five inches wide, so you're displacing a lot of that murky water. Have you ever seen anything else besides fish come through the passage? Yeah, on occasion, actually, we see uh, some river otters and beavers come through. Actually, look at oh, that, look. a it's river cute. otter. So how important is this data and how does it help? This data is actually real important. It helps fisheries managers manage local sport and commercial fisheries. Uh, the Funny River itself is located upriver of the sport fisheries, so it's also used as a postseason assessment on how well we did with our lower or downriver uh, uh, salmon passage programs. So it allows us to estimate changes or uh, document changes in age and sex length compositions within the Funny River and those may be affected by a harvest from sport fisheries. Well you're doing a great job. That was really cool to get an up close look at the fish weir. Yeah it was great to see that they're using new methods to keep the technology updated and efficient. Aqua Kids presents Aqua News. Here's our top story. Current rates of ocean acidification unparalleled in Earth's history. 
In the recent third international symposium on the ocean in a high CO2 world, scientist Dr. Daniela Schmidt concluded that within the last 300 million years, the rate of ocean acidification has never been comparable to what it is currently. Due to the increasing acidification, species are being forced to redistribute their populations. And because of this, species are actually changing in composition, calcification, and growth. Species that are unable to do so often end up in extinction. Dr. Claudine Hari from the University of Alaska Fairbanks states, the chemistry of these waters is changing at such a rapid pace that organisms now experience conditions that are different from what they experienced in the past. Hopefully, ocean acidification rates will decline in the near future to prevent the extinction of many precious species. I'm Katie from Aqua News, keeping you connected to our planet. Now, back to Aqua Kids. Well, we're out of time for today's episode of Aqua Kids, but we sure did learn a lot about how urbanization is affecting salmon and their habitats. That's right. It was really sad to see that human actions are significantly impacting salmon. However, I was glad to see that with the help of new information and eager kids, riverbanks are being restored, and in turn, salmon are being protected. Definitely. You know, it's so important to make sure that kids like us are taking an active role in the environment because we are the environmental stewards of the future. That's right, Drew, and that's why it's so important to remember that everyone can do their part to keep the planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website for cool eco tips. And fun links to show you how we can keep the world and the water a great place to play and explore. And, and we'll, we'll see you next, next time on, on Aqua Kids. Furniture for the Aqua Kids set provided by IKEA.